I want to give Brother Davis plenty of time to preach a couple of congregationals and maybe two specials, and then we're going to have preaching. All right, take songbook 277. 277, I'm redeemed. Some of you fellas help me out there on that bass part, okay? On the first, sweet is the song.
and his wife to come up and sing a special. And then we're going to have Brother Davis up to preach this evening. Um, tonight in the service, I just want to remind you, as we generally do on Wednesday evening at camp, we'll be receiving a special offering for our missionary guests. We do that every year on Wednesday night. This year we've been honored to have Brother Gene and Robin Trask and their family. Amen. That's Kayla and Levi and Lydia and Aaron, and they've been a blessing in camp last week and this week. And our junior campers gave over $700 last week. Amen. Amen. And I wouldn't want, and there was only about 95 of them, and there's 462 of you. Four and a half times as much. So y'all ought to be able to do that in the offering. We want to help them. They're going to be involved in a mission project for the next three weeks. Um, with our ministry, the PTM, they're going to be involved in two more camps and a trip across the border in Mexico. And uh, we want to help them with those expenses. So we're looking to take up a really generous offering tonight. So I want you to pray about it. I believe that giving is a Christian virtue and it's part of the worship experience. Amen. And I believe you as young people need to learn. Don't tell me most of you, most of you can't say don't have no money when I have to be track down to break hundred dollar bills on the last night of camp for canteen i know there's still some money in your pocket so make sure that you pray about it this afternoon and then in the service this evening be prepared to give so you bring your money to the service so you'll be prepared to give in the special missionary offering help the trash family their servants down in honduras i believe brother gene miss robin shared that with you in your devotion time today doing a great work um, in a rare place and I want to be a blessing to them, and I know you do, and the camp does. And so you'll be prepared to do that tonight. Brother Chris, you miss Chloe, sing one for us. And then, preacher, you'll be ready. Dark the stain, that's old man's nature. Long the distance that he fell. Far removed from hope and heaven into deep despairing hell. But there was a fountain open And the blood of God's own Son Purifies the soul and reaches Deeper than the stain has gone So praise the Lord for full salvation God still reigns upon his throne And I know the blood still reaches Deeper than the stain has gone Conscious of that deep pollution Sinners wander in the night Though they hear the shepherd calling They still fear to face the light This the blessed consolation That can melt the heart of stone This sweet balm of Gilead reaches Deeper than the stain has gone all unworthy we who wandered And our eyes are wet with tears As we think of love that sought us Through the weary wasted years Yet we walk the holy highway Standing by God's grace alone Knowing Calvary's fountain reaches Deeper than the stain has gone So praise the Lord for full salvation God still reigns upon His throne And I know the blood still reaches Deeper than the stain on. When with holy choirs we're standing In the presence of our King And our souls are lost in wonder While the white court choir sings Then we'll praise the name of Jesus With 
the millions round the throne. Praise Him for the power that reaches deeper than the stain has gone. So praise the Lord for full salvation. God still reigns upon His throne. And I know the blood still reaches deeper than the stain has gone. Bible that you brought with you, you can get that word of God in your lamp. And be very conscious of the man of God as he preaches to you this afternoon. All right, preacher. All right, take your Bible, please. Turn to Psalm 127. Psalm 127. Good to be here and uh, appreciate the opportunity to preach. A little bit different now, um, preaching in the afternoon like this, and I hope. Uh, Hope the Lord will just help us. I believe he will. I've got a heavy, heavy burden on my heart. Been burdened about camp, of course, and praying over it since last year. But I've got a burden on my heart for the message. And uh, this is a little bit unusual for me. Thank you, preacher. A little bit unusual for me, but I'm going to be using uh, the screens. And our brother's going to put uh, Psalm 127 up there for us. And I want you to look at it. And uh, we're going to read. I'm going to let you just keep your seats as we get into the message. Psalm 127, begin reading with verse number one. The Bible said, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Verse 3, lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As sorrows, as eras are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the wonderful privilege to be here. Lord, it's been good. Everything you've done has been good, and we thank you for it. Recognizing, Lord, that we can do nothing without you. I ask you now to help us, Lord. Would you move in our midst this afternoon? Would you, uh, Lord, get our attention, draw us into your word? I pray you do a real work in every heart, and God will give you glory for what you do. In Jesus' name, Amen. All right. Now, I want you to keep your Bibles open as we look at this chapter, and I'm preaching this afternoon on this question, and I want you to keep it in mind, who will build your house? Look at verse number one. The Bible said, except the Lord build a house, they, the house, they labor in vain that build it. So the Bible's very clear that unless the Lord is the one doing the building, doesn't matter how hard you work, doesn't matter how much time you put in, doesn't matter how good a person you are, doesn't matter how involved you are in the labor, the word of God is very clear that your work or your labor is all in vain. In other words, it's wasted, it's thrown away. Now in this passage, we learn three things. First of all, we learn that it is right to be married. Now we understand that that is not necessarily uh, exclusive. There are some, according to the Apostle Paul, that have the gift of not marrying. That is true. But for the majority of us, it is right for us to marry. The Bible's very clear about it. If you have a bad attitude or a bad opinion of marriage, then please don't talk to these young people and give them your opinion. The Bible is clear. It is right to marry. Secondly, he said it is right to be maternal. 
Amen. It is right to have children. There's nothing wrong with that. We understand there are some folks who are unable to do that. And of course, again, we recognize it's not exclusive, but it is a good thing to have children. I found out in the last few years how wonderful having children is. Unless you have children, you cannot have grandchildren. Amen. And grandchildren are how God rewards you for not killing your children. Amen. And they are barely worth it then, praise God. But listen, it is right to be married. It is right to be maternal. But then we see also it is right to be mastered. What are you talking about? Well, Brother McNeese dealt with it the other night. The Lord is in charge of our lives. The Lord is in control of our lives. It is right for us to bring ourselves to become, to get under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That means he has control of every area of our lives. Now I want each of you young men and each of you young ladies to think for just a minute. I want you to get the couple in your mind, the marriage or the marriage relationship relationship in your mind that you are most impressed with or that has made the greatest impact on your life. For many of you, and this is a wonderful thing, for many of you, that relationship or that marriage would be your mom and dad. Boy, if that is true in your life, if you're sitting here today and you'd say, the marriage relationship that impresses me most is the relationship that my mom and dad have, you are blessed beyond measure. But for some of you, that wouldn't be true. It might be that you would look at the relationship of your pastor and his wife, and that would be the relationship or the marriage that would impress you the most or that may have had the greatest impact on your life and been the greatest blessing. But either way, I want you to find that in your life, and I want you to get that marriage relationship in your mind And I want you to recognize the fact that if you're going to be married, and the Bible said it's right to be married, if you're going to be married, that's what you'd like to have. That is the type of relationship. When I look at this couple, that's the kind of marriage I want to have. No marriage is perfect. Amen. No marriage. You say, well now, preacher, do you and Miss Vicky ever argue? Oh, yes, yes, we do. And it's simply because she's human. And sometimes, sometimes I overlook that, you know, and, and so we get in heart. Whoa, you can tell she's not here, right? Amen. Amen. Praise God, she's not here yet, amen. But we do, every relationship has its problems, every marriage, no marriage is perfect, but praise God, you need to get in your mind, that is my goal, that's what I'm looking for, that's what I want. If that's what you desire, there's no question about it, that you're going to have to let the Lord build your house. Now, when I'm talking about a house, I'm not talking about the dwelling, but we're going to use that dwelling as an illustration today, as a picture of what we're looking for in allowing the Lord to build your house. Okay, brother, would you show them the pictures? There are all kinds of houses. There are those who live in pasteboard boxes. There are different situations where individuals just live in a pasteboard box. There are others who have just thrown up a shanty. I remember preaching one time in a shanty town where every home in that acre field, there were several thousand that lived there, and all of them had built houses out of uh, crates and out of pallets. It was a shanty town. There are those who live in mobile homes. Now, please understand, I'm making no negative reference about living in a mobile home. I grew up in one, have lived in one since I was married. Nothing wrong with that. Several folks or a lot of people live in a mobile home. 
Some live in a home that would be considered more of a ranch style home, just your average home that you find in the average neighborhood. Next slide, please, brother. There you go. And there's one more of those that we've got a picture of. And then there are some, there are some that live in mansions. That's amazing, isn't it? Somebody asked me if I'd like to live in a mansion. I said, I wouldn't want to pay taxes on it. If somebody gave me one, I'm not sure I'd do that. But some folks live in mansions. All of these are different places to live. Some folks slept last night. We've got a bus that we run into downtown Asheville and we pick people up sometimes. Man in our church picks some folks up who come out from behind a building and they slept in a box or slept under a bush. All types of homes or houses are available, but the difference is the price that's been paid for them. If you want to live in a pasteboard box, that won't cost you much. You wander through the neighborhood. You wander through the neighborhood, find somebody who bought a new freezer or refrigerator or washer and they just set the box outside. You grab it, pull it off somewhere, find a place to hide it. It won't cost you hardly anything at all. A mobile home, fine homes. There's nothing wrong with them. They don't cost quite as much as building a stick-built house. And of course, a stick-built house doesn't cost quite as much as a mansion does. But it all comes down to the price that you are willing to pay. Now, if you want to live, everybody here cannot live in a mansion like Brother Brown does, okay? Everybody can, I've never seen his house, I'm just guessing. As careless as they are with toilet paper, they must be doing pretty good, amen. I saw them up here, amen. All right, listen, every one of us cannot live in a mansion. Many of you realistically may not live even in as nice a physical home as you would like to live in. But every one of us can have our home be a mansion. But if that's gonna be true, if that's gonna happen, there's gonna be a price to pay. I want to look at four stages of your building process today. And I want you to give me your attention. I'm going to try to go fast, but I'm not going to be able to go real fast. First of all, number one is your footing. Your footing. The footing of your home is your body. Now look at the slide. Some of you may not know what a footing is. When you get ready to build any type of home, even if you're gonna park a mobile home, in most cases, they're gonna come in and dig a footing. That's where they dig a trench in the ground. They dig down to the hard surface. You do not set it on top of the dirt. You dig down, dig a hole, dig a trench, down to the hard ground, next slide, and then you pour it full of concrete and you build your house on a solid footing. You dig down to the hard ground. Now, I want that footing to be represented today by your body. You need to understand that nobody sees. Me and my family, for the last few years, God allowed us to build a house, and uh, we've lived in that house. Did you know that several people who are here today have been to my house, but nobody has seen my footings? It is a hidden part of the equation. It is a very important part of the building process. As a matter of fact, if the footing is messed up, the whole house is messed up. But nobody ever sees it. It's a hidden thing. And that's the way your body should be. It is no accident that Mary, the Bible said, was a virgin. You need to recognize that your purity, your uh, virginity, your body is a gift from God. It is a gift from God that God has given you. That 
purity is a gift that is given to you that you are to pass on. That gift is to be given to the person that you are going to spend the rest of your life with. Young man, that's just as important for you as it is for a young lady. There is no gift you can give the one you love that is any more precious, are you listening, than your purity. Now there's a huge difference between uh, virginity and purity. I know there are those who would preach a virginity that says you should never have, for lack of a better way of putting it, gone all the way. I believe God's gift to your spouse is not just that, it is your purity. You only have one first kiss. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if that first kiss were given to the one that you're going to spend eternity with? You only, are you hearing me? Everybody needs to recognize, oh, preacher, that is strange. I understand. I understand it's strange, but it's Bible. God means for each of you young ladies and each of you young men to get your first kiss on the marriage altar. That's God's plan. You say, well, preacher, I'm sorry I messed that up. Is my life ruined? Not if you're willing to change it today. Now that first kiss is gone, of course, but it's time now for you to stop the direction you're going. It's time now for you to recognize your failure, recognize your mistake, and change it now. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 18, the Bible said you don't have to turn. The Bible said flee fornication. Fornication, we understand, is any improper sexual activity. Fornication is any improper activity with your body. Whether you are married or unmarried, the Bible said flee fornication. Flee fornication, run from it. He said every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. So fornication is the only sin I can find in the King James Bible that you cannot commit without your physical body. You can commit murder in your heart. You can be a thief in your heart by coveting. But you cannot commit fornication without your physical body. So any improper activity with your physical body is fornication. Paul went so far as to say in chapter 7 and verse 1, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. It's good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, my daughter, I'm going to embarrass her again because Miss Vicky didn't get to come. Bethany, I need you to come up here. I said, uh, this is my daughter. This is my daughter. She doesn't belong to anybody else. Amen. And not till some guy's ready to marry her, but until he has married her, she will be mine. And I guard her with my with my 45. Amen. Amen. You ever seen what a 45 does to the human body, son? You don't want to see it. It's ugly. You say, preacher, several of us might come after. Better bring more than seven. Just a suggestion. Okay? Because I have I have the capacity to put a hole coming out the back that big of seven. Let's see, you're a good sized boy. Yeah, you don't want that. That'd be ugly. Amen. That's my daughter. Okay. Amen. 
She hates it when I do this. Okay, everybody look at me. Everybody look at me. Now, this right here, that's not touching. As 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 says, this right here is touching. So that means that I have no business and you have no business holding anybody's of the opposite sex hand like this and certainly not of the same. Okay. All right. Are you hearing me now? Listen, no business. You say, preacher, I think it's fine for me to hold hands with a young lady I'm not married to. Is it okay if your dad holds hands with a woman he's not married to? Is it okay if your mom holds hands with a man she's not married to? Is it okay for your dad to have his arm around one of the ladies in your church or some lady in your neighborhood this way that he is not married to? If not, then you have no business doing any of those things. Thank you, baby. You have no business. Everybody hear me. I said your body is that footing. It must be dug down deep, a good foundation. You must make up your mind. You want to be you want the Lord to build your house. Your first job is to guard your body. Preacher, how in the world can I do that? The way things are, people think I'm crazy. Listen, keep your body clean. Do not allow anybody to invade it. Keep it clean. Young men and young ladies have no business being anywhere alone. If most of you, if you would live your life based on the expectations that these precious men have put on you, they said early in the week, no, no couples off in the shadows. Why? Because it's dangerous. It is dangerous for you to be alone. Oh, but preacher, I like her. That's what makes it even more dangerous. Preacher, I like him. That's what makes it even even more dangerous. It wouldn't be dangerous if y'all didn't like each other. So keep your body clean. Number two, keep your body covered. Young lady, look at me now. Listen to me. If I'm sitting down on the pew getting ready to preach and you are singing in the choir or singing a special, if I cannot look at you while you're singing without getting embarrassed, there's something bad wrong. If I have to feel guilty for looking at you, keep your skirt way below your knee. Way below your knee. Your Bible's very clear that anytime you show anything above your knee, boys and girls, you are displaying your nakedness. Ladies, don't show your midsection and please, unto the Lord, boys, don't show yours. Ladies, keep the shirts up. Don't, don't do that to your brethren. Say, so, well, preacher, I'm telling you, men are unbelievable. Well, some of that's your fault. Some of that's your fault because of what you're showing. Listen, you're asking for it. It's still wrong for them to do it. It's still wrong for men to look and say the things they do, but you are provoking it. (laughs) If it ain't for sale, quit advertising. If you're not wanting somebody to give you attention for that reason, then quit using that to get attention. Some of you boys, you're out mowing, sitting on that lawnmower, you look like a Buddha. Got your shirt off, my soul. Running around in a pair of short shorts and 
you look like a set of post hole diggers stuck upside down in the ground. <laughs> hey, keep your body covered. You ever know, you, you know how, you know how to tell, you know how to tell Brother Biddy when a young man starts lifting a little weights or working out a little bit, he goes to buy all his shirts a size too small. And whenever he's in public, he quits breathing. <laughs> they got that shirt on that's their little brothers. <laughs> Amen. Being, being a man is not muscle. Being a man is not muscle. You say, well, preacher, there's nothing wrong with being in good shape. No, no, there's nothing wrong with being in good shape as long as you're not trying to demonstrate how good a shape you're in. Nobody at the house of God's really interested. Nobody in church wants to see how well, how well built you are or Nobody wants to see your abs. Isn't that impressive? Isn't that impressive? You say, Preacher, you just don't know how tough I am. I could find out. I could find out. It wouldn't bother me. I, as a matter of fact, I already told you I got a problem. I'd enjoy it. You say, well, what if I whooped you? <laughs> you wouldn't enjoy that. I ain't saying you couldn't do it. I'm just saying it wouldn't be no fun. Wouldn't be one of those things you look back on with pleasure. Because there's no such thing as a fair fight, brother. Amen. That's right. Yeah, biting, whatever. Amen. Now I'm just carrying on with you a little bit. Are you hearing me now? Keep your body covered. Nobody needs to know the shape of your body. Keep your body clean. Keep your body covered. Keep your body contained. You know what you young people need to learn early? And, and tragically, you have very few examples. Are you listening now? I need you young people to listen to me carefully. Tragically, you have very few examples that you can follow. But you must learn early to tell yourself no. You do not need or cannot have everything you want. America's in the shape she's in, preacher, because we forgot a long time ago how to tell ourselves no. Some of you young people, your parents love you, and I'm not being critical of them, but they have never said no to you. Brother Chris, to be honest, right now, just the way everything is in this country, there are very few things. There are some things, but there are very few things that if I'm willing to pay any price that I could not have. I could figure out a way to come up with enough or figure out a way to get it, but I must tell myself no. There are times of my children when I have the money in my pocket and it wouldn't hurt me to get what they need, what they want, but they need to hear no. You've got to tell yourself no. You must contain yourself. You must make yourself do what is right. That's why fasting is so important in the life of a child of God. It's important that we look at ourselves at times and say we could eat, I would eat, but you're not allowed to eat right now. And the sooner you learn that, the better your house will turn out. Who's going to build your house? The footing is your body. Secondly, notice the foundation. I have a few pictures here of the foundation. Now, the foundation is the first visible part of the, of the house. The foundation are those blocks that lay right on top of that footing. You must have a good foundation. That foundation builds on top 
of that footing. What is your foundation in your Christian life? In your house that you want to build. You want it to turn out good. You want it to go well. What is it? Secondly, not only we see that the footing is your body. Secondly, the foundation is your behavior. That's the first part of the house that people see. And by the way, right now, we've been living in our house several years. You can still see the foundation. It's always going to be visible. And you are setting the tone now for what you're going to be. Unless you allow God to take charge of your life, the way you are behaving now is the way you'll behave when you're older. You better get control of it. The Webster's 1828 said to behave means to restrain, to govern, to subdue. To restrain, to govern, to subdue. So when my mama said, when I was a boy, when she left me somewhere and she said, you better behave yourself. What she, what she was saying was, better control yourself, son. You better govern yourself. In other words, you need to act while I'm gone the same way you will act when I get back. Or when I get back, you're not going to be pleased with how I act. Now, the Bible said about David, in four places the Bible said David behaved himself Wisely, you don't have to turn, but first Samuel chapter number 18 and verse 5 it says, And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him and behaved himself wisely. Verse 14, And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Verse 15, Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself, notice, very wisely, he was afraid of him. Verse 30, then the princes of the Philistines went forth and it came to pass after they went forth that David behaved himself, notice this, more wisely than all the servants of Saul so that his name was much set by. The Bible said that David was a man after God's own heart. Why? Because David behaved himself wisely. He controlled himself. He had control of himself. He behaved himself wisely, it said twice in that chapter. Once it said very wisely. The fourth time it said more wisely than all the servants of Saul. And then it said because of that, David's name was much set by. In other words, folks were impressed when you mentioned the name of David because he behaved himself. Let me give you a couple things, young people. Everybody's listening to me. You better learn to behave or control your attitude. You better learn, everybody's got attitude now. Everybody's got attitude. You know, they wear a t-shirt that says, I have an attitude problem. I have an attitude problem. I, my attitude sometimes just shows, you better learn to control your attitude. Let me ask you a couple things and we'll move on. First of all, what is your attitude towards your parents? Well, preacher, I really don't like it when my dad and mom tell me what to do. You better learn to behave that attitude. Amen. You better, I remember years ago, I heard uh, Tim Lee give, giving his testimony. This has been probably 30 years ago. He said he was raised in the home of a preacher and uh, he didn't like his daddy telling him where to go and what to do, when to be in, what, what he couldn't do, uh, what to eat, when, when to come and when to go. He didn't like being told what to do. So he said, I got mad and joined the Marines. <laughs> yeah, jumping out of the frying pan into the fire. You better learn to behave your attitude. What's your attitude towards your parents? I'm not talking about what you would say if Brother Moore was talking to you and said, hey, how's your mom and dad? I'm talking about what's your attitude toward what they tell you to do 
and what they tell you you cannot do? What's your attitude toward your parents and what they've done for you? What, what's your attitude towards your dad who works himself to death to take care of you, but you want to pitch a fit because you didn't get what you wanted? This something that you, all the other kids have, everybody else has got, and you wanted one, so you gave your dad a hard time. Better learn to behave your attitude. What's your attitude towards your parents? Secondly, what's your attitude towards your pastor? What's your attitude towards your pastor? When he's preaching, when he's dealing with that stuff that you're a little uncomfortable with, probably most of those who have a bad attitude toward their pastor are having a little bit of an attitude problem right now. Probably kind of blowing off a little bit, and you don't have to put up with me, but just a few minutes today and then a few minutes tomorrow, but you've got an attitude problem. And your attitude, for the most part, seems to be a problem with anybody who tells you anything you don't want to hear. You better learn to behave that attitude. You better bring that attitude under control. You better learn to look at yourself and say, you know, he's right. You know, she's right. You know, I really do need to do that. Some of y'all don't have any real close friends because you don't like anybody telling you anything you don't want to hear. You don't, you've got an attitude about anybody who don't just fall all over everything you do. Well, you know, preacher, I, I, think I've got a, I think I've got a little bit of a self-esteem problem. And you got that from a psychiatrist. Is everybody listen, look up here at me now. I need everybody, I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna help you from the word of God. I'm gonna help you a little bit. Nobody here has a self-esteem problem. Your Bible says in Ephesians chapter five, listen to me carefully, Ephesians chapter five, your Bible says no man ever yet hated his own flesh. Then if it's not self-esteem, what's my problem, pride? See, the folks that we think have self-esteem problems, most of them, their real problem is they think so much of themselves and they are depressed because nobody else seems to think that much of them. Nobody gives them the amount of attention they feel like they deserve. So we must behave our attitude. You need to learn to behave your anger. You say, well, preacher, sometimes my dad just makes me so mad. You know, my mom made me mad sometimes, but she never knew it. And I was scared for her to find out. You better learn to control your anger. I've seen it a little bit in here. You picked up on it, Brother Moore, over the last few days. When things don't go exactly like you want to, everybody can tell. You say, well, preacher, everybody gets anger. Angry, that's exactly right. And there's a time to anger, but the Bible's very clear and sin not. There is a time to anger. The problem is you're getting angry over the wrong things. You're getting angry. Your anger is a personal anger because you don't like what's happening to you. You don't like what's going on with you. You don't like what somebody did to you. Your anger is about you. It's a selfish anger. Better learn to behave your attitude, behave your anger. You better learn to behave your attention. What does that mean? Control it. Pull your attention in. Some of y'all have got your attention on some things that are very unprofitable. Your attention is being drawn away by money. There are some of you right now, God bless your heart, you would do anything for the right amount of money. You will do anything that you think will get you in the direction of a certain amount of money. Some of you boys, 
your attitude is on a particular car or truck. Can I tell you something, son? Please understand me. And I do not mean this in an ugly or critical way. A 60, 70, or $150,000 car will not make you any more than you already are. You will be the same man in an expensive car that you were without a car. Oh, but preacher, everybody's gonna be impressed. People are impressed for a moment. I've seen some cars, especially some trucks. I've seen some trucks that really impress me. But right now, I don't remember any of them. And did you know, Brother Cox, right after I saw them, I don't remember the guy that was driving them. Why? Because he is so insignificant. He doesn't matter. I've seen some folks dress real nice. I've seen some folks dress real nice. I've seen some folks in, uh, I, I've seen a couple men in twelve, fifteen hundred dollars $1,500 suits. And I thought, man, that'd be nice. I'm not sure what'd be nice about it. Nobody's asked me what this one cost. <laughs> Brother Moore didn't mention a thing about my suit when he told me to come up. We'll have Brother Davis and his so many dollar suit come on up and preach. If I had paid $1,500 for this suit, Brother Moore, and you never even mentioned it, that hurt my feelings. <laughs> I'd want you to say something like, um, it's good to have Pastor Davis and his $1,500 suit. Come on down! I'd want the music playing, the little doohickeys around the edge. Hold it. <laughs> oh, my. But nobody cares. You better draw in your attention. And you know what the Bible said? The Bible said you need to set your affections on things above. Then notice thirdly, if you will, the third part of your house is the framing. Now the framing is another part of the house that everybody else doesn't see once the house is completed. Nobody's interested in it. Nobody thinks too much about it. You'll notice this is the frame and it's built on top of the foundation and it's the boards and the plywood. It's all hidden behind the sheetrock. That is the framing. Now, while you're in the process of building, everybody can see the framing. As a matter of fact, it's one of the parts of the house that has to be inspected. But once that house is complete, nobody else ever sees the framing. You say, well, now, wait a minute, preacher. You said the footing was my body. The foundation's my behavior. What is that framing? It's your beloved. It's the one you choose to build your house with. Can I tell you, young people, and you listen to me careful. This is the main part of the message. Listen to me carefully. I want you to understand, that is, besides your salvation, that is the most important direction from God that you're ever going to need. Oh, now, preacher, I'll disagree with that. I'll disagree. I, I believe first my salvation, but then my call to preach. Let me tell you something, son. You mess up on that, and your call to preach is a waste of time. Oh, preacher, it's my decision. It's my decision to submit to the will of God that we've talked so much about. And, it, and that is so important. But I wish I could tell you. I wish I could give you details, but I can't. Never will be able to. Of all the good men and good ladies that I know of personally, I could give you names and addresses and ages who got saved who submitted themselves to the will of God, they have a great heart for God, but a bad decision on their beloved, a bad decision on the one they gave their heart to, hinders them from ever being what God wants them to be. 
They run into a brick wall almost on a daily basis because they did everything right, Brother Moore, except that. Except the second most important thing. Now look at me. Young people, I'm going to ask you to do something. And when we get to the end of the message, I want you to stay with me now. I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to make a commitment never to make that decision alone. Now, I want to clear something up. I am not asking you to let somebody else tell you who to love. That's the argument. That's the argument. Well, you, we're not talking about prearranged marriages here. I'm not asking them, Brother Moore, to let somebody else, either a parent or a spiritual leader, a pastor, somebody in their life. I'm not asking them to let somebody else tell them who to love. But I am asking you, to let that most important person in your life tell you who not to love. We're not talking about bringing them somebody, Brother Moore, and saying you have to marry this person. But we're talking about somebody who has some spiritual discernment, who loves you and knows you, who's willing to put their arm around you and say, that's not the one. That is not the one. Listen carefully to me, young people. If you spend enough time with almost anybody, you can feel like you love them. You can grow up in a good, godly youth group. You love the Lord. They love the Lord. You can grow up with somebody in a youth group and feel like you love them. And feel like it's God's will. And very easily ruin two lives. So I'm asking you to make a commitment. I'm talking about this framing. Now, everybody sees the framing. Did you hear me? Everybody sees the framing while the house is being built. That's the courtship. While that house is being, everybody looks at the framing. As a matter of fact, there's a lot that goes into the framing. The heat and air conditioning goes into the framing. The plumbing goes into the framing. The electricity goes into the framing. All of those things that make that house work go into that framing. And all of that is visible while you're building the house. But when that house is finished, Nobody ever sees that again. Well, preacher, I I believe maybe it's God's will for this young lady or for this young man, but but nobody seems to like them. They're not going to live with them. But preacher, the kind of young man you're talking about, there are not many out there. You just need one. Preacher, the kind of young lady you're talking about, there are not many out there. You just need one. That's all. One will do you. Let me say just a couple things about them. I'm trying to hurry now. First of all, they must be saved. Young people, you make up your mind right now. Settle it today. I will never allow myself to become interested in anybody who is not saved by the grace of God and show, and seems to demonstrate salvation. Are you listening? You don't even think about it. You don't allow yourself to go that direction. You don't allow it to enter your mind. You never consider it, not once. You say, well, what, what if they get saved? You give them three years. You give them three years. If they got, you met them or they met you, they were interested, you showed no interest. They asked why, you explained why, then they get saved right after that. You give them three years, minimum. <laughs> I'm glad if they got saved. I'm thrilled if they got saved. But if they just got saved, they're not ready for courtship anyway. So you gotta make sure they're saved. Secondly, You must make sure they are secure. 
Um, now, I'm not, I, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but, but since I'm doing the preaching, I have a responsibility. Um, I don't believe this interdenominational courtship is, is ever good. <laughs> uh, listen, if they don't believe that Bible, then they're not an option. If they don't believe the Bible, if they don't like your pastor, you dump them right away. Amen. If they don't want to come, if they don't fit in at your church, if they don't come to your church, if they, if they despise your church or say, I don't believe like y'all believe, say, well, we'll be praying for y'all. You have a good time. Enjoy your life. Go on and serve God. But it is not an option. It is not an option. It's not an option. You say, well, preacher, you know, they, they just, I, I've, I've heard the, I, they just believe a little bit different than us about salvation. Oh, oh, is that all? That, that's all? They just believe different about eternity than us? That, that's all? You want your children growing up not knowing if they're saved or unsaved or what's going on in their life? They must be saved. They must be secure. Thirdly, listen carefully now. They must be spirit-filled. Are you listening to me? Now that's gonna require that some of you get spirit filled. But now listen, I, I'm, I'm get, I know some of y'all are wanting me to get to the separated and hammer that out, but one of our problems, one of our problems in these days, if we've got a bunch of folks separated before they got a touch of God on their life, and they are Pharisees, they're going to heaven, but they're Pharisees, and they're miserable, and they gag me a mile deep. Woo, hallelujah. They need to get full of God. They need to know what it is to enjoy God, and enjoy, man, it's good to be saved. I'm not singing a sad song, I'm enjoying being saved. The average separated independent Baptist looks like he got a death sentence. I praise God for your separation. If you could stay separated from me. Because you depress me and depress my children. <laughs> Woo! Every, hey, their whole Christianity is about what they don't do. Can I help you? My son-in-law said this a few years ago and it helped me. He said, Jesus was never known for what he didn't do. <laughs> now there's a bunch of stuff I don't do. One of them is I don't tolerate them kind of people well. Amen. I'm not impressed by your separation unless you love Jesus Christ. And enjoy, enjoy being saved. Man, it is good to be saved. Hallelujah. Some of y'all need to learn to laugh a little bit. And say, well, how do I learn to do that? Spend some time in front of the mirror. <laughs> you must be saved. They must be secure. They must be spirit-filled. They must be separated. They must be separated. Can I tell you, Brother Moore, there's nothing that will grieve the heart of a wife like a man who has a tendency to put his hand on other women. Nothing will grieve the heart of a man like a woman who has a tendency to be flirtatious with other men. You say, well, preacher, I don't mean anything by it. Doesn't matter whether you do or not, he thinks you do. And if you don't mean anything by it, keep your hands to yourself. Hey, listen, I'm gonna tell you something. If my wife, are you boys listening? You girls listening? If my wife, she never has, but if my wife come through dressed to go to town, like some women in our Baptist churches are dressing, not only would she not be going to town, we'd be having a long talk. Are you listening? Are you listening, girls? I'm telling you, you don't dress to impress. Now, now in saying that, 
in saying that, there's nothing wrong with dressing nice. Um, I fear that we've had some good godly ladies who have wore their tater sack around. Y'all know what a tater sack is, don't you? That's a sack taters come out of. Let me clear that up. It is a potato bag. For some of y'all from north of the Mason-Dixon line. But I'm telling you, man. I, some of these girls would probably be a, willing to be a little more modest in their dress if they didn't have to dress like their grandmother. Right. Yeah. Right. You're right. And, and girls, you don't. You do not have to dress like your grandmother. And, and Lord help us men who are too tight to let our wives and the ladies in our house spend money on nice, modest clothing. Amen. That's right. They must be separated. They must be separated. I can't imagine... I can't, I can't imagine what it would be like to be married to a smoker. Seem like, I mean, I get, the, I get the idea of sticking my lips down in an ashtray. Hey Amen. You know how to tell, we got anybody from West Virginia here? Anybody, you know how to tell if a boy from West Virginia is married? There's a snuff line down both doors. Just you, hey, there wasn't nobody here from West Virginia. Amen. Just kidding. Alabama's the same way. Okay. How many from Alabama? What do y'all think of electricity? It's, it's nice, isn't it? Amen. That's, that's what makes it cool in here. Can you believe it? Praise God. Everybody can see your Bible to hold it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, thought, I thought some of them was looking at me on the screen, but they're looking at the lights. Man, how, why is the building not burning down? They must be separated. Then let me say this, they must be submitted to the will of God. There are very few things that cause a broken heart in the life of a, a Christian that wants to serve God like a desire to go somewhere and do something for God and to be stuck unable to do it. James Stewart, not the actor. James Stewart that helped Basil Maloff start the Russian Bible Society. His precious wife, Ruth Stewart, served God with him for all of those years. They traveled all over Europe. Then they came to America, and God used them in a great ministry. Brother Stewart got extremely sick, and she spent the last few years of his life taking care of him. Her daughter and her daughter's husband have a ministry, and they run a bookstore in my town. Her name is Miss Sheila. I was talking to Miss Sheila one day, and this has been several years ago before Miss Stewart went on to heaven. And Miss Stewart had married, remarried after several years, she had remarried a man, a preacher by the name of Lotto Pfeiffer. And they were talking some and seeing each other some. And their hearts were kind of drawing each other together. They were probably in their late 60s their hearts were drawn each other to each other and he talked to her some about marriage and she was not interested really in in making that step and finally at one point miss sheila told me that brother pfeiffer looked at at miss stewart and he said would you consider marrying me and here was her reply she said if you'll take me back to the mission field Why? That's all she'd ever known. She said, I don't want a partner who wants to sit down and die together. And so at that age, she said, I'll marry you 
if you'll take me back to the mission field. Finally, the finished work. I've got just a few pictures and we're done with the pictures. You can't see the footing. Right now, you're not paying much attention to the foundation, that finished work. That finished work is your blessing. That's what everybody gets to see. Young people, look at me for a second. That's what you see in that couple that I described to you at the beginning of the message. That's what you're looking at. That's what you sit in the pew and look at and say, boy, that's what I want. That's what you sit at home and look at and say, that's what I want. That's what you see in that Sunday school teacher, that youth director, and you say, that, that is what I want. That's the finished work. You have two choices. In your marriage or building your house, you can have a life of sorrow, a life with no real love, no laughter, and that does not last. Or you can have a life of satisfaction. That means there's real love there. Me and my wife have been married 33 years. You say, well, preacher, has it been perfect? Her half has been much more perfect than mine, but neither half has been perfect. But it's been great. I get as excited, Brother Moore, about her coming down tomorrow as I did about the first year of us being married together. Probably a little more. There'll be laughter. I enjoy laughing. Did you know the Bible says a merry heart doeth good like a medicine? You know, some couples don't have any real joy in their marriage. They don't know how to laugh together. They don't laugh at their circumstances. They don't laugh at each other. And then it doesn't last. Now I'm going to ask you to do two things. Number one, I want you to turn to Psalm chapter one. And I'm going to give you a choice today. And then I'm going to ask you to do one more thing and I'm done. Psalm chapter one. Psalm chapter 1 has six chapters, or six verses, excuse me. The first three chapters talk about an individual who has allowed the Lord to build their house. The last three verses talk about someone who would not. Psalm 1, 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now, I don't know how you young people feel. That's what I want. I'm, I'm not positive personally that's what I have, but that's what I want. That's what I'm striving for. Now, here's the other option, verse 3. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away, Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Now you young people, every one of you can think of two drastically different couples, drastically different families. One family is in verses one through three, and you would love to have that type of relationship. The other is in verses four through six. And nobody's happy there. Now I'm going to ask you to do one more thing and I'm done. Brother, if you will put up that last slide. I'm going to ask you to write these words in the back cover or front cover of your Bible. Don't do it yet. I pledge by the grace of God that from this day forward, with the help of those who love me. Now, look at me. I want you, I hope most of you can choose a daddy and mama. At least a daddy or a mama. But if not, I want you to choose a pastor 
or somebody that you know walks with God with the help of those I love. Notice it now. I will allow the Lord to build my house. Now, if that is your desire, I want you to write those things down. I don't want you to sign it and date it until you're in the altar. This is not, I'm, I'm begging you not to come unless you mean it. But if you mean it, son, God will honor it. If you mean it, young lady, God will honor it. Is it okay if I get Brother Chris to play? Brother Chris is going to play for us. Nobody's moving around. If that's what you want, and only if that's what you want, I want you to write it down in the back of your Bible, front of your Bible, whichever you choose. And then when you're done writing down the pledge, I want you to do the signing and the dating in your Bible, in, in the altar. Father, would you help us now meet every need, touch every heart. Lord, may every young man and young lady from the depths of their soul submit themselves to let you build their house. In Jesus' name. Preacher, I'm done. <clears throat> if that's what you want, you write it down. Sign it and date it here. I think I can do it the other way and it'll turn out okay God will not violate his own principles regardless of what you think yes It's fine. It's fine if you're sitting there trying to decide. That's a decision you have to make. Your pastor can't do it for you. Your pastor's wife, your mom, dad. Nobody can do this for you. It only matters. It only counts. If it comes from your heart. Oh, I can tell you, it works. It works. Preacher, I'm afraid if I do it that way, it will take too long. I wish I could tell you how many I've talked to who wish they were still waiting. They're still wishing they were praying about it and waiting on the Lord, but it's too late. Yes. God's got her out there somewhere if you're willing to wait on her. 
Young lady, God's got him out there somewhere. If you're willing to wait on him. Amen. Young people are still coming. You take your time. We're not in a hurry. It's not too late. If you've decided that's what you want in your life, it's not too late. Come on. Amen. You may have wrote the pledge down, but you're not positive. If you want to come sign it, that's fine. You just think about it. We're not, we're not trying to count heads. We're just waiting on the Lord. You just keep doing business with God. I wanted the trash to sing a song for you that I thought was so appropriate for the message. Thank you, man of God. Thank you. He would rather you go home mad at him today than for... Lydia, can you come up on stage, please? He'd rather you go home a little upset with him and a little mad at him today than to have to be preaching to rescue your broken family 10 years down the road. We see it over and over and over again. Oh, let the Lord build your house and you can sing this song. same style you'll have to be the same in your separation you'll have to be the same in your security amen you'll have to be the same in that spirit filled condition if this is going to be what you get I've been doing youth camps long enough to know, Brother Lee, that in a meeting of this state, and I know I did the registration for all 462 of you. We've got some older young kids in here. Some of you are in that 18, 19 year old range. And I'm not ignorant to the fact a message like that's got two or three of you worried. God's done disrupted some things in your heart. You better thank the God of heaven. You better thank the God of heaven that he cared enough about you that he sent you a man of God to disrupt it. 
He's got, he's got you questioning some things about that relationship you're in tonight. He's got you questioning some things because he's trying to spare you. He's trying to help you. You better let him help you this evening. You better let him help you. And I don't know, the Holy Ghost just nudged my heart, Brother Davis. There's a lot, of, there's several couples, and I'm not talking about courting couples. I'm talking about you married couples that are in here this evening. And uh, maybe the Holy Ghost just nudged you right, and as an example to some of these young folks, you take your wife by the hand, sir, and walk down these aisles, get in this altar in front of these young people and say, y'all pledge to let God build your house, and we're going to pledge to let God keep our house. We're going to pledge to let God keep doing the work in our family, and in our house. We want to serve the Lord together. And I'm going to go out on a limb and maybe even open up a little door. If you keep honest before God, not, not create a scene in the altar. If I have an engaged couple in here, Brother Davis, I believe it'd be all right if they came to the altar together. I believe it'd be all right to say, God, what are you doing in my life? I want Brother Gene and his family to, we're missing one, but they'll, 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 they'll work. I want to sing a little bit more of that. God's done stirring in my heart because I sure appreciate God when he rescues people. And he stops things before they destroy you. Sing a little bit more. adults you have family here you're welcome to come down pray with your family you have family you come on i want to make sure you know that's an option Joy. 
of planning our wedding ceremony she asked me was there anything I wanted and I said one thing well there was two but one we'd already agreed on but when she was picking out the music I'm of the persuasion that the wedding itself is the gift to, to the bride and uh, I said just one thing I said I don't care how many songs you have and I don't care what songs you choose but I said I want that song sung at my wedding as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. I didn't marry till I was 38. And I, somebody called 911. Where's the nurse? Miss Allison, seven passed out right over here, if you don't mind helping these girls. I didn't marry till I was 38. But the Lord put that in my heart probably 15 years before I got married. one request and they did and we almost shouted and then we went ahead and tied the knot and God's good God not only has a wheel but he has a time for that wheel I'm trying to let you go to supper but I'm just going to tell you something some of you will miss God's will because you can't wait on God's time God's not only got a wheel, but he's got a time. You let God's time work, and it'll work well. Amen. Thank you, preacher. Thank you. I was adding a few things I wanted to add to the message, not to add to Brother Lee's message. That's not what I mean. He didn't take it that way, but I just I thought, praise God. If I was in a shouting church, I'd want to make sure she was. I wouldn't want to spend the next 50 years of my life embarrassed because I worship God in the presence of my, my spouse. Amen. Somebody say amen or I might preach. Amen. Amen. It just matters, kids. It matters. Amen. I know, a, I know a young man. He's not so young anymore, but he's a missionary in a foreign country. And... Uh, his name come to my mind while Brother Davis was preaching. You would know him well, Brother Gene. And there'd be others in here that would know him well as well. Brother Mark, you'd know him well. And he's got a, he's got a godly mother and dad that are deeply involved in the work of God. And they had always had an agreement that when he met somebody he liked, was interested in. And by the way, that's natural. 
It doesn't bother me that you took notice of somebody at camp this year. Amen? And I'd rather you meet somebody at camp than down at the mall. Anyway, he had an agreement with his parents that when he met somebody, he would, he would make arrangements for his parents to meet that young lady. He had gone away to college, and he'd make arrangements for the, his parents to meet that young lady uh, in a proper fashion. And he would not pursue that relationship until he had his parents' blessing. And I talked to his mother we were at a missions meeting together, and we were sitting talking, and, and uh, he had brought home, I say brought home, made arrangements for a young lady to come meet his parents two or three times, and good girls. His checklist was right, and the ones that fulfilled the checklist were right, and some of them went on to do great things for God. That's not the point. But the parents said after prayer, they'd say to him, Jason... We love you, but she's not the one. And he never rebelled against that. He just kept looking. There was a little period of time when he didn't really pursue anybody. One day he met a young lady and they began to converse and talk. He had already surrendered his life to missions and he was a little reluctant to make that fact known early in the conversation. She looked at him and she said, I like you pretty well, but she said, I don't think I could see you. And he just said, why is that? And she said, because I need to go to Africa. He had already surrendered to Africa. They're not there today, but it's not their fault. They're still on the mission field, but politics sent them to another country. They're still serving God. I wouldn't have somebody who didn't have the same ambition to serve God. Amen. I'm on the road. I'll preach on the road 45, 47 weeks a year. I couldn't do that if I didn't have a wife that had the same ambition to serve God. You can have something good. but you better have to wait on it. All right. Um, somebody call the kitchen, Brother Scott, run ahead of them and tell them they're coming. Like, well, they call those ants that cut the bushes. <laughs>